Hello, and welcome to the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving GDAS webinar series. Before getting started, please remember that the link to the SurveyMonkey post-test will be pasted onto the last slide. The post-test will remain open for an indefinite amount of time. Please take it at your earliest convenience, though we encourage immediately following the webinar. A certificate can be provided when entering your email address at the end of the post-test. Today's webinar will be Avoiding the Ostrich Syndrome, presented by Dr. Felicia Goldstein. Dr. Goldstein is a professor in the Department of Neurology at Emory University School of Medicine. Her clinical specialization is in geriatric neuropsychology, with a focus on the early detection of cognitive changes associated with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. She is board certified in clinical neuropsychology and is a fellow of the American Psychological Association. In 1989, Dr. Goldstein established a specialty neuropsychology clinic in the Department of Neurology. Through this active clinical service, she supervises and mentors graduate students in clinical neuropsychology. Welcome, Dr. Goldstein. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I'd also like to thank the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving and the Georgia Division of Aging Services for the opportunity to present this webinar on the topic of avoiding the ostrich syndrome. Um, my objectives for this talk are several. Um, first of all, I want to review the scope of the problem of underdetection and underdiagnosis of cognitive impairment, not only in persons affected by cognitive impairment and their care partners, but also in the primary care setting. Next, I'm going to review some of the research explanations for why persons with mild cognitive impairment or dementia may not seek a diagnosis, and also why primary care practitioners may be reluctant to screen and share the diagnosis of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. And finally, I plan to discuss some of the positive reasons why a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment and dementia are beneficial and how explaining these positive reasons to patients and their significant others could convince them to seek consultation and also to get assistance. Well, just by way of review or brief review, it's, it's not uncommon in normal aging for people to experience changes in their cognitive functioning. These become especially noticeable in our 50s and older, although changes are even detected earlier in life. The types of examples I hear most often from persons I see in my clinical practice include such things as reduced word finding ability. For example, the tip of the tongue phenomenon, whereby people aren't able to come up with the right word they want to use. The other thing I hear very frequently are memory complaints. For example, why did I enter this room? What was I looking for? Where did I put my keys? But sometimes in some people, these cognitive changes are greater than they are, should be expected for age, and they begin to significantly affect everyday functioning. In my neuropsychology clinic, I evaluate someone's performance against age and education peers to see how far their scores deviate from the norms so that I can determine whether or not they're functioning is beyond what should be expected. The two diagnoses that go beyond normal aging are mild cognitive impairment and dementia. In mild cognitive impairment, a person exhibits cognitive changes that are greater than expected for age. These are also noticed by either the person, their significant other, and or by clinicians but the person is still performing everyday instrumental activities of daily living, such as driving and paying their bills. Approximately 20% of persons 60 years old, 65 years old and older 
have mild cognitive impairment, and we know that MCI is a risk factor for the conversion to dementia. About 46% of people with MCI develop dementia within three to five years, and persons with MCI who have memory problems are at the greatest risk for Alzheimer's disease. In dementia, a person's cognitive changes are so severe that they now affect their everyday functions. Persons can no longer independently perform instrumental activities of daily living, and they require assistance with such tasks as taking their medications, paying their bills, and driving. It turns out that while some people are aware that something is wrong with them and with their cognitive functioning, more than half do not seek professional help. The reason why this is important is because at the initial baseline visit, individuals who have subjective memory complaints have been found to be at five times the greater risk of developing future dementia. This slide shows you the results of a uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention statewide survey. And this survey indicated that one in nine people 45 years and older report experiencing confusion or memory loss. Yet, 56% did not talk to a healthcare professional about this. And risk factors for having subjective cognitive decline are being African American, having less than a high school degree, having a low income level, less than $15,000 a year, and also living alone in about 30% of people who are surveyed. In Georgia, where I practice, one in seven people 45 years and older report that they experience confusion or memory loss that is occurring more frequently or worsening. More than 50% have not talked to a healthcare professional, and more than half say their cognitive decline has interfered with their performance of everyday activities, social activities, and their work ability. Of people who do see a primary care provider, fewer than half of them report having been told they have Alzheimer's disease. This is true not only for patients, but also for their care partners. This slide shows the percentage of seniors diagnosed with a certain condition or the care providers who are aware of their diagnosis. As you can see, about 45% of people with Alzheimer's disease say they have gotten a diagnosis or are aware of it through their caregivers say this, compared to stark contrast of 93% of those who have cancer, 90% of those with cardiovascular disease, 83% of those with high blood pressure, and 81% of those who have arthritis. So reasons commonly cited by primary care providers for not providing a diagnosis include, first of all, a lack of time and resources, not having the time to, uh, in a busy practice to be screened for cognitive impairment and to sit and discuss the results with the patient and their family. PCPs also cite the lack of effective treatments for dementia and Alzheimer's. In one study, 25% of healthcare providers indicated that the lack of treatments that were available to modify the course of the disease was a factor in choosing not to disclose a diagnosis to their patients. There's also fear of causing a catastrophic reaction, worry about causing depression and anxiety in individuals and their care partners. And there's also uh, a concern about difficulty being able to explain or discuss dementia with the person or family, not knowing how to convey these findings. And in recognition of this difficulty, particularly the latter one, the Gerontological Society of America, in collaboration with the NIA and Alzheimer's Association and other agencies, 
has created a toolbox of educational materials, not only to guide uh, PCTs in how to how to kickstart the op the um, conversation with patients and their families, but also uh, some advice about how to screen or instruments to screen for cognitive impairment. So. Uh, Dubois and colleagues in a recent paper summarized all the papers out there that have looked at beliefs and challenges to receiving a timely diagnosis of Alzheimer's for patients. And what they summarized were the following reasons and beliefs and challenges. First of all, um, normalization of symptoms that uh, people with memory problems may tend to attribute these to normal aging. They may prioritize when they see a care provider their physical problems over their cognitive problems. Certainly financial limitations, limited access to health care are cited, fear and anxiety, depression, potential for suicide, which actually um, is quite low in patients who are told the diagnosis, but still, of course, a, a concern. Social isolation and worry about loss of competency and autonomy, that is, worry that their privileges are going to be taken away, such as their driving privileges. Some of the beliefs and challenges for families about uh, receiving a timely diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease are similar to those of the, of the patients. They're also tending to um, believe that some of the cognitive symptoms are normal for age. They have financial limitations and access to health care, limited access. They also worry about um, you know, depression and fear and anxiety and the loss of a patient's competency and autonomy. In addition, they have some unique concerns. First of all, they're worried about changes to the family dynamics that will occur if patients receive a diagnosis. They may be reluctant to take on the caregiver burden. You know, now they um, have to take charge and are in control and they may not want this burden. There's patient resistance, certainly. Patients may not want to see a doctor, may say nothing's wrong with me, and it's difficult for families to convince them. There also can be disagreement between decision makers, that is, family members may disagree about the patient. And just physical distance, um, some families don't live close to the person experiencing cognitive problems and therefore may not even be aware as much of the problems that the patient is actually having. So this begs the question of whether or not people want to know their diagnosis. And it turns out that people, most people do want to know the diagnosis. When they do have dementia, they want to know the cause of it. Um, a paper by Elson and colleagues looked at people. Uh, they had 95 people who were coming to a memory disorders clinic. These folks were greater than 65 years of age or, or they were 65 or older. They all had memory complaints, and they were asked, whether they would want to know if they were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. 69% said that they did want to know whether they had Alzheimer's disease. And this trend has been found in other studies as well. These are reasons the patients in that study cited for wanting to know their diagnosis. First of all, to enable advanced planning. These are actual quotes that were cited by the patients. I could plan to purchase things like a wheelchair, the person said. I could find out about Alzheimer's disease associations. It's helpful to face up to it. They wanted to facilitate psychological adjustment so that you become less frustrated with yourself and that I would accept it. They really wanted to be kept well informed. I want to know what's wrong with me. I'm inquisitive and I don't like to have a condition I don't know the reason of. And they also wanted to consider treatment so that I could be treated if possible. So I wanted to um, review with you now some of the reasons why it's so important to avoid the ostrich syndrome. And I know that many of you or most of you listening to this are clearly aware of the benefits of knowing the diagnosis. But I thought it would be useful to review these and also for when you speak with patients and families to emphasize some of the positives of knowing why it's important. And one of the most compelling reasons is that 
Disease-modifying treatments may have their biggest benefit when implemented early. There are currently no medications that can prevent or cure Alzheimer's disease, although there are certainly very active attempts going on. Numerous studies are looking at these. But it's widely believed in the field now that that's because we start too late with treatment, or we don't start early enough when treatment is possible. And really, the way I explain this to the patients I see is I liken it to cancer. I say to them, I'm so glad you came in to see me because, you you know, if you think about cancer, you want to catch it at stage one, not at stage four, because at stage one, we can actually do something and um, help you. And this seems to really resonate with people when I explain to them the importance of early uh, intervention. If we look at um, this slide, right now, these are some of the common drugs that are available on the market. And we basically start giving these drugs when people either have mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia. And this approach is not um, particularly successful in halting or preventing the progression eventually because we already have the neuropathological consequences of Alzheimer's disease already past a certain threshold. The goal right now is to start these treatments um, very early. In fact, the field has moved towards prevention in the preclinical stages. If we could identify people very early, um, we can make a big impact on their performance and their functioning. So this is the goal, really, of treatment, to, to start disease prevention therapies very, very early in the preclinical stage. And so we want people to be aware and to come in early as possible because we may be able to really effectively manage their disease. Another um, compelling reason for telling people why it's important to avoid this ostrich syndrome is because it's really critical to obtain an accurate diagnosis of the disorder and rule out other causes. This slide just shows you the types of dementia, of course, Alzheimer's disease we know is the most common. 60 to 80% of people uh, with dementia have Alzheimer's. But there are also other causes of it, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, and then the other types such as frontotemporal dementia and normal pressure hydrocephalus shown um, in this pie chart here. If we can rule out other causes, um, we may be able to effectively manage the current uh, disorder or even find another treatable cause for it. One common thing that happens in older adults uh, is that they're very sensitive to medication side effects. And anti what we call anticholinergic drugs are very commonly prescribed or taken over the counter by older people. These include things such as antihistamines for allergies, certain incontinence medications they're taking can have strong anticholinergic effects. They may be on certain depression medications with anticholinergic effects. The reason why this is important is because these medications are, uh, with moderate to high effects, are definitely associated with poor recall and executive functioning. And also um, on imaging studies, are found to uh, be related to greater whole brain atrophy and also temporal lobe atrophy, which is important memory structure in the brain. And we know that uh, anticholinergic drug use is associated with an increased risk of conversion from normal cognition to cognitive impairment. So just basically having a, a, an in, a, a provider review the patient's medications, look for side effects can be very beneficial, and that's a reason why someone should consult with a, diet, with a um, clinician. In addition, um, there are a number of vascular risk factors that older adults have that also can exacerbate their cognitive functioning and, and cause cognitive impairment. 
these on the left are the most common ones that um, older people have, particularly hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, cardiac disease, and also sleep apnea are all um, very uh, treatable disorders in older adults. They're associated not only with stroke, but also are known risk factors for mild cognitive impairment and also for Alzheimer's disease. These vascular risk factors can change the curve of normal aging. So when you add hypertension onto normal aging, you'll see a dip in cognitive functioning. And then on top of that, you add diabetes, you're going to see a further decline. And then you add hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, and you see even a further decline. So there's really an additive effect of these vascular conditions. And it's very important that they're well controlled. We encourage um, people to go to their pharmacies and buy some very common instruments to help them with uh, monitoring these vascular risk factors, such as a cholesterol measurement, obtaining a measure of their glucose, measuring their, their blood pressure, their sleep quality, et cetera. So all of these are very easy things that people can do to get under better control of their vascular comorbidities. We also know that diet, dietary intake is very important. Um, the Mediterranean diet has gained widespread uh, interest and uh, prescription, really, by our physicians at Emory, not you know, uh, recommendations to go on a Mediterranean diet because it's been found to be extremely heart healthy and it's definitely associated with better cognitive functioning. This study by, in Columbia University looked at the relationship between diet and developing Alzheimer's and they had 2,000 dementia-free adults who were 65 years and older and they found that persons who consumed a Mediterranean type diet regularly were 38% less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease over a four-year follow-up. Um, so, you know, another uh, reason why the ostrich syndrome really <laughs> should be avoided by patients and families is that it really improves communication and helps to understand behaviors when people receive the diagnosis. These are words from, taken from a memory support group uh, led by um, Dr. Um, sorry, by Susan Peterson Hazen, who's a um, clinical social worker in our memory disorders program. Susan um, wrote down some of the comments that patients have made over the years in her support group. And one person commented, we can talk more openly about her memory problems now, and that has been a relief. Another one commented that telling others was an important step for us. Another uh, individual has said that we focus on and enjoy what we can still do, which is most things. I know now to blame the disease, not my wife, and if all else fails, I give her a hug. So clearly there are benefits that, and sort of a relief that people experience when they know what's wrong, they can deal with it head on, and they understand that a person's behavior is not intentional or meant to annoy somebody, but it's because of changes taking place in the brain. And that really helps um, families to understand what's going on. The diagnosis of um, dementia, Alzheimer's, and even mild cognitive impairment is a tremendous source of stress for families and for individuals facing these diseases. They cause major life changes. They change family dynamics. They could cause changes in the environment. They're unpredictable and change social relationships. They also can produce fears, uncertainty, and beliefs that may be very, very stressful for that individual. We know that stress is 
uh, chronic stress produces changes in the brain and can also exacerbate uh, cognitive functioning. Uh, we know that chronic stress is associated with reduced connectivity between brain structures and poor communication. Uh, it also results in smaller brain structures such as the hippocampus, which is very critical to uh, cognitive functioning and can also, of course, uh, result in significant depression. When I started in the field um, in 1989 at Emory, there was very little, in fact, really nothing I could tell people, it was even before I believe Aricept was out, that I could tell people in whom I diagnosed Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, it's just you have this diagnosis and you know, unfortunately, there's nothing out there that, that we know of that can really help you at this time. The field has totally changed, um, and it's very exciting for me personally because there are now a number of proactive and protective behaviors that people can engage in. And um, one of the most important of these is physical exercise. Of all the non-pharmacological interventions out there, Physical exercise perhaps is the, has the strongest evidence behind it, and there are numerous multi-center trials right now looking at the benefits of physical exercise in people with mild cognitive impairment and with Alzheimer's disease. The reason why it probably does have a cognitive benefit is because, first of all, it reduces chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It can reduce stress and depression, and it improves sleep, so therefore it reduces insomnia. Some direct benefits of exercise are to improve cerebral blood flow. So if we look on the right, when a person has clogged arteries um, by plaque, the blood flow is not smooth and it is reduced within the brain. But <laughs> exercise can reduce some of that uh, plaque and the narrowing of the arteries, thereby increasing blood flow to the brain and improving cognition. Additional um, benefits of exercise, physical exercise, are higher levels are associated with decreased brain atrophy, and really exciting now is findings that changes in CSF biomarkers are AD, of AD are affected. So physical exercise has been linked to reduced beta amyloid in the brain, showing it has direct act, um, effects on the neuropathological features of the disease. So the guidelines for uh, exercise frequency are that healthy older adults should engage in about 150 minutes a week of moderately intense aerobic activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity activities for at least 10 minute intervals. And in uh, addition, muscle strengthening exercises resistance should be done more than twice a week. <coughs> Excuse me. The National Institute on Aging, excuse me, I'm going to Take a drink here. The National Institute on Aging has a very exciting website, Go for Life, <clears throat> in which they have videos for exercise and also um, recommendations for people. In addition to physical exercise, Cognitively stimulating activities are also beneficial. <clears throat> so at Emory, we have a continuing education program where people can come and take coursework and different courses. Other uh, community places have um, <clears throat> college uh, courses that older adults can take and can stimulate thinking abilities. Social engagement is also very important. The NIH has a terrific website <clears throat> where they um, recommend activities that people should be involved in, such as joining a senior center, 
uh, traveling with friends, serving meals, anything that gets a person out and active and engaged with other people. <clears throat> the um, ability to get an early diagnosis and to face up to having a devastating illness is also the opportunity to engage in pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions. <clears throat> the NIA has a great website, the ADIR website, where people can get on and find uh, Alzheimer's disease and related clinical trials. They can <clears throat> search for clinical trials in their area just by putting in certain keywords. The Alzheimer's Association also has what's called trial match, where people can get on and search for clinical studies in their area and see what studies they qualify for. Right now on the website I got on, said they have more than 250 studies that are conducted across the country and online. <clears throat> At Emory, we run a memory support program. It consists of cognitive rehabilitation, wellness education, and group counseling. And we teach people with mild cognitive impairment to use a notebook calendar system. So the example I show here, people can write down any appointments they have. They can write down things that they need to do for the day. They can write down things that they want to remember. And these are for people with mild cognitive impairment in the very early stages. Dr. Melanie Greenaway, who's now at the Mayo Clinic, designed this program. And in her study, she had 40 couples. 20 of them received notebook calendar training. And the other 20 um, did not receive training in using the calendar. They were just told to use it if they wanted to. But they didn't get uh, sessions where they were taught how to use the calendar. She found that two months later that patients who were in the train group were rated by their program partners as more independent. They had greater self-confidence. They had less emotional distress. And also the program partners had significantly improved mood at two months and six months later. So these types of early interventions are available now that weren't available years ago and it can really improve quality of life for patients and their significant others. Planning for the future is a very important reason for why people should um, go out and try to find out what is wrong and, and figure out um, how, to, how to get help. Again, from our memory support program here, one of the people um, with mild cognitive impairment said, don't take responsibilities away from me. I want to be included in our life and decisions that need to be made. So this is um, important to people who are affected by MCI and, and Alzheimer's. They want to be involved, and now is the time where they can make their wishes known, whether they want power of attorney, who do have, they want to have power of attorney, what they want to do in the for end of life decisions. Elder law attorneys are um, experts in dealing with people who are older and who may have disabilities. Um, many are knowledgeable about Medicaid and Medicare, and also um, many of them can handle guardianships and uh, can, can um, conservatories. And these uh, were not, elder law attorneys were not uh, available years and years ago. This has become increasingly uh, a specialized field. This site lists um, some ways that, that families can learn about uh, elder care, learn, uh, elder law attorneys in their area. Resources um, include uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Caregiving Center. They have a planning ahead module that has a wonderful information for families uh, to obtain about end of life and, and lots of legal uh, information. And the Rosalind Carter Institute also has an education and training website. 
So I hope um, I've summarized for you some of the compelling reasons, I think, for uh, avoiding the ostrich syndrome that may convince families and their uh, persons facing memory problems of the importance of seeking care and um, being proactive early on. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Goldstein. It was such a pleasure. Um, please remember that the link to the post-test is pasted on this last slide. Um, please take it at your earliest convenience. Again, a certificate can be provided um, by entering your email address at the end of the post-test. And please remember to view the other webinars in the RCI GDAS webinar series. Thank you so much, and I hope that you will join us again.